Okay, I guess we should start because we are three minutes ahead of the schedule. So uh, I would say Chesh. Chesh. Thank you so much for, for being in my session. So I have actually two big challenges. Uh, the first challenge is that you are after lunch, so you may be more sleepy. The second challenge is that I'm reading this session after uh, the session of uh, Dr. Venkat Subrabanyan. So uh, it's even more challenging for me right now. So a few words about me. My name is Dmitry Alexandrov. I work for T-Systems. And uh, I'm um, a Bulgarian Java user co-lead. Uh, and as you see from here, I like airplanes. Yes, I even could uh, program this one, A320. Uh, but uh, I'm mostly you know, involved in uh, coding in Java and uh, um, mostly for bloody enterprise. And uh, I also try to do conferences. So, OK, so uh, we have a plan for today. We want to rethink the way that we use system resources. And um, I truly hope that after this session, um, you will at least try to, you know, at some situation, you will trigger the event on how would you do this or this uh, or, or another stuff. So, and to do this, we actually need to understand one word which is the word asynchronous. So what did I get from Wikipedia? Uh, what is asynchronous? So asynchronous is a form of a computer uh, control timing protocol in which a specific operation begins after receiving a signal. And the, uh, actually, the operations are going uh, not the same rate or not exactly the same rate together with something else. And uh, in simple uh, words, what do we actually do? Uh, so I start task somewhere else. We are not defined this else, but somewhere else, somewhere in the background. And uh, after this task is ready, actually, we want to be notified uh, that we have the result. And I need then after to somehow take this result and process it. In terms of Java or uh, maybe other languages, so we, what we usually do, we start a new thread, put some work inside there, do something there, and then try to think how should we get out this result uh, from there and somehow to process it. So the, the, there's a big headache on how to get this result, how to get it synchronously, and so on and so on. And why on earth should we actually do asynchronous stuff? Yes, because it can be really faster. Yes, it can be faster. Because why? Because there is, it's a non-blocking approach. Because there are no gaps between tasks. Right after the task is ready, we start with another task. And as it's non-blocking, we are actually uh, benefiting from that. Because blocking is waiting. It's doing nothing. And as we do nothing, all other resources are just wasted. And we want to avoid it at maximum um, possibility as it is. So, and to get this uh, understanding on how can we do this in, uh, in Java 8 mainly, um, we need to have a look at uh, it from some different perspectives actually, because several technologies made it possible. You know, we actually involved to this position, so now we can use it quite easily. So, let us uh, make some, you know, step back to history and uh, see the evolution of multithreading. So all of us, mainly in universities, I guess, somebody from, you, from schools, um, we have begun to offload some work as we start new threads. So it was kind of a very you know, straightforward. We uh, implement runnable, so do some work in the, define some work to be done in run method, then we just start new thread. Or we even can extend the thread and do some work there. But, at a certain point, we realize that, you know, parallel programming is very hard. It's not just a floating a work somewhere there and uh, taking it back. And it's very hard. So all this waiting, yielding, you know, uh, synchronizing and so on and so on, it's very hard. How many of you have read this book? How many of you have read it once and understood everything? 
Okay, how many of you have read it 10 times and understood at least 10%? That's me. I read it every, every year, and every year I find something new. Yes, because it's very, very hard. But still, this book is amazing, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a must-read book for everybody. So, and at a certain point in um, 2004, people somehow realized that this concurrency stuff is very hard, and we have to make it a little bit, you know, easier. And uh, in 2004, there was uh, released this concurrent API with the Java 5, and uh, there were several constructions which were uh, which were available to 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 people to to, to the users, uh, which somehow put off this low level abstractions to something higher level, and. At least they thought it will be more understandable. It's still not very much understandable. But still, they have introduced these uh, thread pools. Or we could now offload this work and somehow say, execute this work, do this asynchronous stuff, and so on and so on. Still, it was you know, kind of a, um, a little bit you know, uh, high level of abstraction. And with it came the future. Yes. So what is a future, actually? Uh, by the terms of, you know, um, of uh, theory, this is a primitive for creating a multi-threaded applications. And you will be surprised, this is something not very much new. The first concept of future was introduced in 1977. I wasn't even planned to be born at this time. By this wonderful paper of Henry Beck and Carl Hewitt. Actually, it was about garbage collection. It was fun. And what is actually a, a future? So if you know every function, so every, every work in our um, no, computer, computers are made to calculate something, to do some work for us. And uh, a function, something is produces a result. So and um, as this function produces a result, we have a function. Uh, we want to put this work uh, or actually the, the production of this result in some kind of a container, because containers are now everywhere. We cannot uh, start a conference if there is no th word about containers. But container is not uh, a um, you know, theoretical, um, theoretically defined word. We use it just uh, for our abstraction. So we put this work, uh, the result of production of this work inside of a container when we actually handle it and care for it. So, and uh, you know, putting this work in a container, uh, you will be surprised. There is another word which comes always comes together in our, um, you know, in, in, in words in future, is actually the promise. So, promise is actually the calculating of this work asynchronously and putting it inside a container. So, container we can consider it as a, uh, you know, write once container. Uh, where promise puts a work. So this right once container is called future. So they always come together. They are um, sometimes mislead that future is a promise and promise is a future. Actually not. They are different parts of the same. So and you will be surprised that this is actually not very much uh, new stuff too. Because uh, the term promise was pr proposed even earlier, in 1976, by Daniel Friedman, David Weiss, and uh, Peter Halbert called it eventual. Just, you know, try to understand, try to feel the word eventual, so we have this uh, core word of event here. So this is a wonderful paper. I could even buy it on eBay or something like this. It's not public, but uh, it's very interesting to read. So, and uh, as we talk about, you know, work inside of a container and so on, the main concept of uh, future is that all the magic, all the work should happen inside of this container without ever leaving it. So, um, we put a work, you know, we, we put a function there, it produces some kind of result. We can transform this result in a container. We can chain this transformation of the result. But, uh, and then at the end, as we actually produce whatever we want, we are eligible to take this uh, value out of it. We cannot just you know, take the value, put it inside of a container, do something asynchronous, then pull it out. 
do something in synchronous and put it back. So we actually, uh, by the concept, we should never actually uh, remove the value outside of a container. Uh, and as the expected you know, calculation, expected result is done, we actually do callbacks to uh, pull it off and use it. So it's a final terminal operation in our uh, uh, in work with uh, futures and promises. So and what was this future in Java? Actually, it was uh, a nice structure, quite nice. You probably all know this code. So we uh, take a, an executor service, we submit some work inside, and we try to ask, is it done? Is it done? Click, is it done? Is it done? Uh, and uh, as we are actually bored to be checking, is it done? We just uh, get the result, and that's it. So the API is quite simplistic, but there is one, one small uh, drawback in all this thing. So we are quite close to theory, uh, but we are not, because get and get timeout are blocking operations. Here, by these functions, get, we are actually breaking the law. So if we take a look at this diagram, so there is a main thread and a, and a different thread that we submit the work there. We submit the work, and as we submit it, so we can continue our work as it is with, with zero done time. We just continue our work in our thread, and this work is offloaded to be uh, asynchronous. But, of course, we usually do get operation. As we do get operation, the main thread blocks, uh, and we are waiting for thread one to finish its work. So all this time, uh, which you, when the results are ready, we are actually blocked. We're doing nothing. And what we want, we want to you know, somehow put the cat and do something useful in, uh, in, this, uh, in this main thread. So from the definitions, we don't have to uh, wait or block. So how do we escape from this situation? So of course we do callbacks. Yes, we say, okay, I offload you the work, and then when you're ready, notify me somehow. Okay, let's imagine we have a kind of a construction which is done with, uh, uh, with um, Java 8 stuff, with suppliers and uh, consumers. And this is actually doing one thing. So it takes an executor service, gets the result from a supplier, uh, wraps it inside of a try-catch block, uh, and uh, on success it accepts it, or uh, on fail it just, uh, you know, here I said accept, but we can write a log message or something like this. So, um, and let us try to do something useful. So we want to calculate Fibonacci's numbers, which can be a time-consuming operation. Uh, for my demos, I try not to use the internet because it's usually fail. So F Fibonacci is quite, you know, uh, or even prime numbers. We can use prime numbers here for the next time I'll write. Prime numbers are time-consuming operation, so it can be offloaded. And what we say, so we can uh, asynchronously call Fibonacci, put it inside this executor, and print line. And if something goes wrong, we just, you know, print stack trace. Okay, that looks pretty nice, you know, with this small wrapper, we quite gracefully offload this work to another thread without even noticing it. But what if we want to change something? For example, we want to calculate prime numbers, like here. We want to calculate Fibonacci's numbers, and we want to make uh, an intersection between this. I don't know, it's a quite a weird idea, but uh, for some mathematicians it may sound reasonable. Uh, I couldn't find reason personally, but it's a good example because it does not use internet. Uh, and uh, as you see, this code is not readable. It's not maintainable. It's not even debuggable, I would say. Because all the actual work happens here in these red lines, and uh, it's, it's ugly, I would say. Nobody writes like this, although we have all these opportunities to do this. And... Um, Actually, the, same, the, the story is, did they try to do this somewhere else, all this approach? And of course, everybody uh, remembers this Node.js stuff. How many of you have coded Node.js? 
in production? I mean, in real hardcore production? Lucky you. Because, you know, they have introduced this uh, non-blocking API with event-driven modal. And of course, well, the new for that time was that everything was made asynchronous based on callbacks. And there was so much cool about all this callback. We said, okay, this will, you know, solve our problems. We don't need JavaScript itself. It's not a multi-threaded language, but we're still able to do this all asynchronous stuff very beautifully. But in reality, we came to this wonderful picture, callbacks everywhere. Yes, which led to some other picture which is called callback hell. Yes, in production it was undebuggable to work with this. And uh, here uh, I'm honored to uh, cite Dr. Venkrap Subrabanyan. So if you say callback to a JavaScript developer, he will start crying instantaneously. Yes, this was the message from, uh, from his last session. Yeah, so in reality, it was not so much cool. And people started to think, okay, we need some other mechanism to fix this. And this, uh, then came this promises library, Q library. So it was really a wonderful uh, approach. So instead of doing this, you know, inlining, I would say, function in function, calling function, calling, call big, calling back other function, uh, the Q library actually allowed us to make a call and then, with the construction of the word then, uh, we could chain different events uh, which are happening actually asynchronous, but we can chain them and gracefully handle exceptions and gracefully handle the final result. So th all the things here are actually happening inside of a kind of a virtual container which, uh, you know, all the works happens inside of uh, this, uh, this construction of uh, Q. And after we are done, we're just, you know, getting the value out of the container or do something else. So, but not only in JavaScript. So, as you see, uh, the, the future in Java 5, starting from Java 5, was actually a kind of a not full future. It was kind of a partial future which violated the law. And uh, the guys from Google say, okay, we don't like it. We want to make it, uh, we want to make it a real future as it should be by, by, uh, by theory. So they have created this listenable future uh, at this time, but it was, you know, complicated. It was really complicated. How many of you are using the production? Nobody. i sorry, maybe because of the lights. Nobody. Okay, you're kind of a lucky. Uh, somebody of you have worked with Cassandra databases? Well, actually, there are uh, futures from Guava. They say, okay, we have this contract of this operation which can be, uh, you know, time consuming. As it's time consuming, we return you the future of this operation, but not just the future, but listenable future. So you can do more things with it. And uh, to use it, uh, it was hard. So we have to decorate our executor. Uh, we have to, we could add callbacks in quite, you know, a civilized way. But um, as I said, I tried to use it once in one project and it was complicated. But it addressed a very, very good idea of uh, the fact that uh, we do not transform the value out of side of this container. So every, actually everything happens inside of this virtual container, which handles all this work inside of a, uh, you know, controlled environment of, of a future. And we can transform the values inside. So Guava gave us the opportunity to be more um, theoretically correct in using uh, futures and promises. Then came another, another library, it's called uh, JDeferred library. Uh, I think that Ray Tsang is uh, the, uh, one of the authors and he is now on this conference, so you, can, you may talk to him. And there is a very nice uh, article by Alois Anmirai here, just happened now on this uh, latest Java magazine. Uh, and it, it actually helped us a lot 
to, uh, trans to, to work the same way as we did with the Q library. Uh, and uh, JD Furt, if you read in this article especially, is very good in the idea that we actually separate the, the futures from promises, which is not going to be able to do in, uh, in pure Java. Uh, so uh, you may try, but there is one small drawback here, is that sometimes we are not allowed to use third-party libraries. There's a quite a productive situation, uh, especially in banking environments. So for every library, you have to get a permission. And uh, if we're not allowed, we have to do something else. And so the idea is how to achieve an asynchronicity in Java 8. And you will be surprised, maybe not surprised, because it's not a new material. So actually, Java 8 uh, is available since 2014. How many of you have you actually used Java 8 in production? My god, how many of you uh, use not only Java 8 JVM, but the features of Java 8, like streams? Well, fewer or less hands. <laughs> So still, still may, 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 in many, many uh, you know, companies, the migration of Java 8 happened to come just to migrate uh, the same code uh, to another JVM. So, but uh, this was a game changer, which was, uh, in my opinion, comparable to lambdas and streams, but it was some kind of a, a little bit forgotten. So in Java 8, asynchronicity is done only by one single class. It's called the completable future. And it's available since actually 2014, March 2014, which is, uh, and it's in the core library since Java 8. So how, what they did, so they have uh, used the future uh, interface, uh, and they have added another interface which is called completion stage. And completable future actually inherits from extends two of this interface. As you know, in Java, uh, we can extend uh, multiple interfaces, not multiple classes. And they've added a lot of magic inside of this, um, on this completion stage. So from now on, we are able to do composition of elements, function resolutions, transform the values inside, chain the values inside, complete the futures, and do all these things synchronously and both asynchronously. Uh, and uh, to, you know, to get to this class, we need to talk about some foundations. So the foundation, the main and first foundation, which makes us easy to use this class is, our, of course, the uh, lambdas and method references. So Java 8 actually had them, and uh, the uh, completable future, of course, benefits from them. So as you saw in the Guava example, it was very, very hard to uh, write something reasonable for callbacks because you have a lot to write a lot of codes, which is quite of unmaintainable. It's really unmaintainable and undebuggable. So here you just use lambda and uh, method references. The second big foundation came actually from Java 7 as the fork join um, uh, thread pool uh, came available and it became a, an amazing helper for asynchronous operations, because why? So by the algorithm itself, it's care much for cache corruption. So what do you mean uh, cache corruption? As you see, uh, it's very good if one task uh, operates on one single core. So, and uh, we know as we use the data, the cache lines are filled with the data which is mostly used and the cache hits are uh, actually speed ups in, our, in, this, uh, in this approach. But uh, we don't have this unlimited resource, of course. Uh, and that's why we have to split our task to multiple cores. And for join here, with its um, you know, work ceiling algorithm, uh, and it's in its theory, help us a lot to keep as much tasks uh, in one processor the, the more time possible. And uh, just right when the, you know, the, the, the QR operation is full and we have um, you know, all the thread fill up with task, then it just steals back from the task uh, from the queue from the task queue the last task, keeping the task like here, which are closer to be executed, um, 
in the same thread by that's why you know caring about this cash corruption so we are more likely to have cash lines uh, uh, cash data cached inside our processor which will be mostly used so uh, these two foundations so um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, you know how we use it actually made it very very easy to introduce a uh, completable future to um, to our developers so if we go back to completable future, so how can we create such a future? Um, as we say, just a class. Since to just a class, we can use a new operator. So we create, we can create a, an empty container. I would say it like this for some job to be done, uh, just like create a new class. But there are much better ways to do this, which are actually supply async and run async. Uh, so with uh, static member static methods, and uh, we just, as you see from from the definition, we we say the container. Okay, so this is the work that has to be wrapped inside our container and given to you, just supply async, or with run async, we just this is the work that has to be done, um, and. Uh, Please, as you run it, we don't care about the results of just run async. By the way, let us try to do this. I have prepared some, some small code for you. I think that screen is so much big that you are able to see everything, yes? And I have no, no, no reason to enlarge it. Or I'll do something like this. Uh, is OK? OK, so as we say, Okay, we want to calculate prime numbers. Prime numbers is a time-consuming operation. Um, and we don't want to do this in an asynchronous way. So we say, uh, completable future. Uh, okay, okay. Just give me a second. Uh, I will even do it like this. So okay, so get primes. It's, it's a very you know. Uh, I've written the code here. Uh, so if we make a completable future of it, completable future, and as we say, we just uh, supply some operation here, and we pass a method reference, which is you know ID is very great supporter here, and we say. After it's done, okay, please print it. Okay, system dot out dot not dot double dot. We need a method reference print line. Mm -hmm. I say. So we supply a sync, we say, okay, I'll float this somewhere else, calculate it, and after we're done, please show us the result. Um, well, what will happen? Okay, it's working, it's working, and actually nothing happens. What's wrong here? Why don't we have any result? Somebody has an idea? Exactly, so we have now just done our multi-threaded program without realizing that this is multi-threaded program. So, and if you say, for example, uh, system out print line, and uh, here we say, I don't know if I'm writing this correct, but change to uh, this direction or the other direction? Okay. Krakow. You see, as it's asynchronous approach, we just run it, and we only receive here this hello Krakow, because the other thing is offloaded to different thread. And the, to realize, actually, we have to do some work, we, the, the work really happens, is that we can do, for example, uh, system dot in dot uh, read something, just to to prove that it's working. And you say it now works somewhere there. Works okay. You see, after some times, the thread actually, as it's done, as it's calculated, 
we chained our events so that we just print them out. So our program is working, but we have just now done a multi-threaded programming without even realizing we're doing multi-threaded asynchronous programming. Looks pretty impressive, huh? Um, so this is our approach. By the way, as you see, uh, the power of uh, Completable Future is so big that we actually can supply our own executors here. But for default, we use for a joint pool. So as you say, uh, for termination, we can e actually complete this future or complete it exceptionally. That means that we're saying, okay, here we have a failure. Uh, we declare this as we have completed it exceptionally. Uh, but it can be completed only once. And as you probably saw, uh, there are different ways to complete them as well. We're by chaining the, um, the method, so we start a new container, put some work inside of it, do some work, and we have a terminal operations like then accept that we consume the result or run uh, something after the result is consumed. And by the way, remember this, so that the transformation has to be done inside of a container. This is nicely done by then apply function, for example. So, uh, as you probably saw, we can now uh, calculate this, and then we can chain somewhere else here. Like, for example, I think I... Uh, have prepared initial get average. So we receive a list of operations, and we want to get an average of all this, you know, prime numbers. And uh, you see, we do all this transformation right inside of the uh, container. The container does not does the value the calculation itself does not leave the container. So that's that's kind of a very interesting result for mathematicians as well, like, you know, 9,000, I don't know why it's like this. But as you see, it's done completely asynchronously and um, uh, it, you know, compliance the, uh, compliance the approach, the theory underneath. And uh, as you see, it starts very, very beautifully. And if we dive deeper, we have a very big infrastructure here. So, as you see, we can do smart transformations because as, as it's a class, we can return a completable future of a completable future of a completable future. That is absolutely possible and it's legal, but we don't want to do this. And that's why we have this then compose method and then compose async method, which help us to avoid the situation of completable future and completable future. It works just like a flat map. So, uh, it just unwraps it for us. It's very smart. We don't have to think about it. So if, for example, we have a synchronous operation of reading a file, and then we have an event like, for example, read the file, then process the file, and then print the result, we are uh, absolutely OK to uh, use the compose method. It will unwrap for us all these completable features inside, and we are uh, completely beautifully you know, uh, asynchronously chained here. Or, for example, we want to combine some values, for example, some futures. Too. We need a result of two futures. And we can use then combine method and then combine a sync method. So if we uh, use, for example, to calculate prime numbers and Fibonacci's numbers, in terms of usual futures, we have to put this work in futures and then make two get operations, which is bad because gets are blocking. And uh, with the construction of uh, then combine, we don't need this. I will show you later in the demo. Uh, and of course, if we don't want a further processing, uh, we need to, uh, we can call, of course, meta like accept both or run after both. So with two futures, uh, as they are done, then accept both. Or accept some of them, accept either. That's an interesting situation. For example, you need, um, we just want a first available result. Uh, and uh, a good example here is a DNS. For example, we have several DNS servers, and we say, okay, all of you, who, who knows this address? And the first return address is actually something that we need. So it's a, uh, well, we don't need other results from the other service. But what happens uh, to the second results, actually? The second result, the idea is that this future actually never completes. 
and uh, it may be hanging around because uh, there are, by the uh, constructions of, uh, not construction, but the approach of future, several other futures can be, you know, dependent on your future. So by this operation, like accept either uh, or run after either, you just handle with care. You can also get the number of dependents to see. So, um, of course, we can apply to either operation. So as they are done, we can apply some transformation. Or we can have a more ge generic method, like call all of the futures. So we can uh, wait for all of the futures to, uh, to finish, or any of the futures to finish, just like in this DNS approach and the DNS example. But please have a look at their results. So uh, all of is void, because here we cannot predict what actually are the, um, the f what are the other futures beta. We can supply futures of string, integer, or another class. Here we cannot predict what will be the first available, or all of the first, it's not possible. For any, we have an escape of object, as you see. So it should be an object, but then it will be kind of a, uh, uncertain what to come next. So here we lose the type information. That's why I personally never use this methods inside of my production. And as uh, we were talking, so about the exception, on the previous session of uh, Dr. Venkatsu Bravanian, you see exceptions in these approaches are handled like normal operation. That's not a stop of the world. And uh, the, all of the approach of this asynchronous completable futures are the idea that Exception can happen. And we are able to gracefully handle this exception and make it part of all of our process. So first of all, as you see, we can exceptionally hand, uh, finish uh, our uh, future, or we can handle it with, uh, with a handle function, which actually accepts by function, which is kind of beautiful, because uh, here you have this uh, um, lambda with two values. First one is the value which is produced, and the next one is exception. So if everything is OK, um, we just continue. Or if we have an exception, we just do something else. So we can you know, put it inside of the chain and gracefully handle, because the exception is propagated through all of the chain. And here, this is a normal result. So if we go back to all this, uh, to this function about uh, reading files, you see, the code itself becomes very, very beautiful. So we supply it asynchronously. Uh, we receive a future. We compose it with our future as it is. We print the results. And if something goes wrong, we can handle it gracefully. And as you probably noticed, so the, unlike the future, um, the API of the class is really big. Yes. Uh, although it most, mostly fits, uh, so we have methods that have synchronous and asynchronous uh, um, you know, versions of it, but it most fits to this pattern, but there are mo almost 60 methods inside it. That's why this class is called one of the scariest in Java 8. There are many uh, friends uh, of mine say, why don't you use completable futures? They say, because we don't understand all these method names. Yes, we can, we just, it's very hard to use. But still, if you get used to them, it will come very naturally for you. Um, and uh, I personally believe that this is one of the game changers uh, in Java itself uh, in decades. So, uh, completable futures are very nice if you start to think about this chains or flows of events and ev in events in tasks themselves. So. Not every, uh, uh, not every um, uh, problem is OK, but if you are able to think in flows, events, and tasks, futures, uh, completable future construction itself is, is something for you. But you know, here we have some bad heredity. And of course, it's the get method. Get method is blocking. So because we actually inherit from completable future, and uh, we have to live with it. But this get method is actually uh, both good and bad. Because uh, with get method, you are able to do synchronous calculations. So for example, if you are designing an API, and um, 
you know, you, you declare by saying that this result is wrapped in a completable future, you somehow declare to your customer that, okay, this operation may take time. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a long-lasting operation. And um, the client itself can decide, okay, is this a long-lasting long operation? I can change some events, or if I want to make it synchronous, I just make get the function, uh, get the result. Uh, and as you see, um, because there are streams, they have created also a join operation. This join operation is very interesting. It's also a get operation, but this get operation is um, is uh, does not throw a checked exception. And uh, it's very beautiful. But I've made a small demo for you. How can we use this? Uh, as um, we see, uh, we are able to do uh, some asynchronous jobs, some parallel asynchronous jobs. Let's imagine the following situation. We have to send several emails. Uh, these emails can be said absolutely asynchronously and in parallel. Those, these operations are not dependent from each other. So, and how can we, uh, how, how do we usually do this? So we do this with parallel streams because, uh, because they are just, you know, very easy to use. But let us, um, I will say you, I'll show you the task itself. The task itself is currently very, very, um, you know, uh, easy. Oh, so we just sleep for one minute, but maybe here we're sending an email. Since we don't have internet, we will imagine this. We do parallel task, but we want to make it a little bit different. We say, okay, so sending a task, we will wrap it in a completable future and just throw away somewhere asynchronously. And then we receive back the results. Why do we want to do this? Because in parallel streams, we are not able by means of the construction of the uh, construction of uh, parallel streams to uh, say which executor should be used. And in parallel streams, we only have this fork join pool available to us. Here in the completable future, as you saw the construction, we can submit other executors and we want to benefit from this. And as uh, you will notice, which is interesting here, if we run the same stuff here, uh, just give me some more, some more time. Uh, as we construct here uh, by parallel streams, you will see that we have a fork join pool common worker, so we were using fork join. But all the sending of an emails will take each of the tasks last one second, but it takes about two seconds to send all of the messages. If we do the same thing here with completable future and submitting it to other executor, uh, which now I think is is a, is a just a, you know uh, not a for join executor but uh, just a usual yeah, fixed thread executor, we will do the same task only in one second. You see, this availability of uh, executors to be uh, submitted to completable future makes us a very good job because uh, the completable future itself uh, can now benefit from other thread pools. And we are okay to, and we have really one second benefit here, which is which is observable. So when this join operation is kind of a get, which is not blocking operation, we are. It's done mainly for uh, uh, for working with streams because we in, in streams we don't have uh, the possibility to work as check exception. So you can also obtrude a value, which is you know to see um, um, what's happening inside, but never do this. So, but have in mind, so uh, a good example for this, which we actually use in our project, is that we, as an enterprise, we want to um, calculate something in a synchronous way and send it back to the client. And uh, unfortunately, before uh, Java E7, we had to use this get operations because we didn't have any construction for this. Uh, we have to do asynchronous stuff to a certain point. After Java E, it looked like this. So all of our main thread actually was blocked every time while two threads were calculating the values. But in E7, we had the possibility to do an asynchronous response. We had an interest infrastructure to do everything asynchronously. So we calculate all our stuff here. 
uh, we apply the results uh, and the, uh, we apply the results directly to this asynchronous response. So uh, we received an opportunity to make a real chain of asynchronous events even on the server. So that's a good example of this. So as you see, uh, the primes, the, as the values are calculated, we are not blocked in this part. And not only um, on the server itself, in JavaSRS, we have received a possibility even on the server to get this because with the new Rx um, function, we receive as a result a completion stage, not a, f um, not a uh, just a future. So we are able to do this uh, truly uh, asynchronous on both the server and client. But still believe get is evil. I mean, if you are designing your API, but, uh, try not to use get if you are trying to make uh, it asynchronous. And as you know, Java 8 arrives July 17, or not exactly July 17, or we don't know. <sighs> yes, there is a JEP which actually extends to work, um, and it gives you a possibility to um, make some better work with completable futures, so it's, a, it's not only tied to Java 8, and uh, as you see, there is an, some strange work. If you supply asynchronously, uh, you know, work, we can complete it with a default value and make our get method not blocking. And we say, okay, while this value is calculated, please submit us, uh, return, always return another value, which is the default value, for example. Uh, well, it will, if we call get, so, but this makes the program a little bit unpredictable. So we can complete the future, and the good part here is that we have um, more uh, possibilities to work with uh, timers uh, and schedules. By the way, uh, the first talk about completable futures was done by uh, uh, your citizen, uh, Tomasz Nurkiewicz, I think. Uh, amazing guy. And there he introduced this uh, unblocking timers and schedulers with some tricks. Uh, a very nice idea. But here you can do this uh, even more beautiful. So we have timeouts built inside of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the completable futures. So and you can complete it both with uh, by function. So if uh, the price is calculated, like in this example, uh, please do something. If not, sorry, we cannot return. So we are tied to, to timers here. Oh, we have this complete on timeout. We can either have a default value or in, in, in one second, for example, in one amount of uh, time. Or we can, if it's not calculated in this, uh, in this uh, period of, of defined time, um, then return something default. It's an option, but uh, still there is, uh, my personal approach is that there are several uncertainties about, about undefined behavior. So this undefined behavior uh, is um, dependent now on time and it's very hard to see if the, 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 the program is actually returning or responding correctly. But at the end I wanna say a few words about reactive, yes. Uh, um, Mr. Dr. Venkat Surabhanyan gave a very good explanation about reactive, but still I'll have my uh, small approach. So what is reactive? As you say, it was the new cloud. So if you program reactively, you have all these benefits. Yes, um, which are written here. Yes, uh, but until the serverless, I think, mean, came out. <laughs> so now if you use serverless, you will receive more benefits. Uh, but still, it's not something new. As you say, it's an uh, observable pattern, so the keyword is asynchronous. And actually, this completable future is quite near to this uh, pattern, as we say. If you read this wonderful manifesto, now everything has manifestos, and Reactive has its own manifesto, of course. And of course, we take a look at this wonderful picture, which is shown on every conference worldwide. We still see that uh, um, completable futures quite nicely fit in, in this idea of responsive 
elastic, as we say, we work with the resources, we use multi-threading underneath uh, without even realizing we have the Moody threading. And it's very resilient, so we keep the, the uh, exceptions uh, as a part of the flow, uh, and uh, it's, um, they're handled gracefully now in this case. The only thing is hidden from us, this message-driven idea. So this message-driven idea that, okay, I'm here, I have finished my task, I now signal you to continue by the chain to do the same stuff, it's hidden from us. So we don't have this message-driven uh, available. But still, um, as you see, uh, Reactive is good for, uh, for CPU usage, for cache usage, and so on and so on. And even if I, uh, I've created, as an example, API, uh, and see that uh, we, um, by using only completable futures, by these gaps that we don't have to kill without this blocking, we see that it could serve more responses today. So the blue graphs is actually the result, but it's only by introducing this non-blocking approach. So it looks really nice, um, quite nicely fits to reactive patterns. And what's good about completable future is that it comes out of the box. You know, you don't have to think to use different libraries um, and to, you know, care for them much because if it comes with a JDK, then it is tested. What is beautiful about uh, something that comes from the JDK? It is tested. Uh, it works good. Uh, it works proven. So Java 8 is one of these things, but handle this care. And I say once again, mind the gap. So um, in synchronous application, you may have it. In asynchronous, you can you know, do it without it. And uh, that's all from my side. So I say, Jinkwe Bardzo. Yeah. Yeah.